Um, yes. So, what are some of the other positions you've had as a scientific illustrator? And well, before uh, we get into what you yeah. think the trade might be. Well, I, uh, I started out uh, illustrating my own insect research. Mm. And then, uh, on the basis of my insect drawings, a uh, particularly a trusting professor hired me in the anatomy department and at the at the time I worked for the anatomy department at Michigan State University it was actually contributing to all three of our medical schools oh. so I was actually doing drawings that ended up both at the veterinary college of medicine the osteopathic college of medicine uh, and the uh, allopathic college of medicine so um, that was a beautiful and lucky start for me because I was sort of at the hub of medical imaging then. Mm -hmm. So and so, I did things for instruction. Uh, I did things for publication. You know, uh, where people have a piece of research that hinges on a, a piece of anatomical feature in which they have discovered this new enzyme or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there were lots of possibilities. And as you get better and better at it, you know, a lot of times the researcher who is asking for your help here may only have a sketch of what they want to convey to the viewer, and your sense of drawing and design will help put that in a way that makes an attractive illustration that's good for teaching mm -hmm. and still captures the expertise level that you were hoping from the person who sponsored the drawing, but yet you've brought your own personal uh, sense to this drawing. Right. Um, when I illustrated the anatomy and histology of the channel catfish, one of the great pleasures to me was they let me pick the viewpoints. And so I would orient the skull in the best way to show the brachial arches and to show these mm -hmm. various other features that were the that were the stuff of being able to know which bone was what and where. Right. Good eating too, wasn't it? All that and more. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, when we were talking earlier before uh, we started rolling the camera, yeah. uh, rolling film, you had mentioned also working on fossil records for plants. Mm -hmm. And do you want to describe to our viewers that and this was particularly intriguing because uh, you can mention how long ago we you think it might have actually been living, but mm -hmm. what were the different subjects that your researcher gave you to work with? Yes, uh, this uh, was a professor who was de describing a new species of conifer uh, from the last third of the Cretaceous period. So we're looking at in the uh, 70 to 73 million years ago mm. time frame. Still dinosaurs. And dinosaurs were around, but this would be one of the trees they would have walked by or taken a munch off if they were a sauropod. Mm -hmm. And what I had to work with was maybe 40 or 45 fossils. Mm. And on these fossils, <clears throat> several of which were excellent quality, <laughs> others of which were not so excellent. Some had most of a leaf, some had just the tip. Others showed the connection to the branch, others showed the bark of the main trunk. And the whole challenge was to take all of these pieces and by combining it with my understanding of how conifer trees grew, um, to combine them to see how much of this plant I could reconstruct and of course defend every bit of the detail from this fossil or this or that. Right. And so uh, ultimately we were able to get uh, the uh, bark texture of a main branch to a finer branch to the scale like leaves uh, pretty much all the way to the tip. Wow. This particular specimen didn't have fruiting bodies which <clears throat> would have been excellent but again um, this, uh, this plant was going to be described from the evidence that was at the table. Wow, that's really something. Yeah, it was great fun. Yeah, um, now you also mentioned earlier uh, working for the veterinary college, osteopathic college, mm -hmm. uh, and when we talk about uh, uh, really what is of interest to our viewers, mm -hmm. uh, our, our artists, you know, mm -hmm. what can I do to get a job in this field? Now that would be more of a medical illustration type channel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going to hospitals and warehouse, do you suppose? Uh, well, medical illustrators, of course, would be used both by hospitals and by schools and by, uh, and by researchers. Okay, and so, primarily universities, though. So a lot of yeah. that kind of thing would be done at universities, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, large, re you know, if you're in a metropolitan area, there are large research hospitals who have their own science illustration departments, uh, not only because a hospital of that caliber is actually doing research, but also because they're also producing an abundance of educational materials. Whether they're educating their colleagues, other residents, whether they're educating folks in the nursing schools, or whether they're educating civilians about how to take care of some aspect or some condition. And all of these take medical drawings in order to demonstrate to people the 
combination of technique and anatomy or what else they have to learn to, 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 to make this, uh, this treatment or this uh, thing work for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then going back into scientific illustration like mm -hmm. yourself, mm -hmm. uh, book publishers, people looking to do mm -hmm. grant work and... Right, a lot of people um, who have certain kinds of research um, actually apply in the grant for money for the illustrations that they think they'll need. Mm. And then those people, of course, are looking for people who can control the information right and make good, credible, easily understood drawings to demonstrate what they're doing. Right. Um, that could be uh, anything from uh, demonstrating different techniques all the way to uh, or, uh, whatever. Many, mil millions of kinds of techniques. Right. Oh, okay. uh, but then the other part is um, many of these people are into discovery of new species. You could end up working at a school of oceanography, for instance, mm. where you might be illustrating uh, 15 new species of cephalopods that were discovered at great depth and you have preserved specimens to work with. Wow. And then it's a matter of choosing a viewpoint where you can show the most amazing and compelling parts of its anatomy mm. and at the same time um, uh, these are what we call habitus illustrations. They'll go right in the publication with the description of the new species to guide whoever comes next in this field. And they say, when they have one of these guys in a jar in front of them, <laughs> they got your drawings out here, and they say, well, it can't be this because it doesn't have this weird thing in it, but it could be this. You know? Right. Oh. And then, uh, you know, that, that's, again, the education mission that all science illustrations sort of boil down to. So it, it must also kind of give you some satisfaction that your art will be used somewhere else in the future. Well, sure. No, and, and any time you come uh, get your work in one of these publications, you know, these publications don't go away. You know, they'll mm -hmm. be, you know, long after your uh, grandchildren are uh, doting over you, uh, <laughs> there will still be people looking at these publications. Right, right. Absolutely. Oh, very good. Okay, so... Um, in, in these other areas that we've been talking to artists about in terms of like product design, you, you might have to become an engineer or take certain uh, software classes, you know, AutoCAD and that kind of thing. Or if you want to be an architect, you might actually have to get, you know, become a registered architect. Uh, certainly there's schooling involved. Uh, when you become an illustrator, I'm sure you have to take some classes, but what is what are one of the benefits of being a, a scientific illustrator? Well, in my world, uh, one of the benefits is that, I mean, you still have to understand the science. And so if you were going to apply for work uh, illustrating birds, for instance, uh, you'd want to make sure that you were uh, pretty much up to snuff on, on some of the aspects of birds, you know, because you were going to have to carry the ball here. But uh, the nice thing about this profession in my world is that uh, it is largely a portfolio profession. That is, if someone needs drawings, they are ultimately going to be looking at the portfolios, the drawings, the preparations that people have made. Right. And if you're competing with someone who has a degree from the Rackham Center of Graduate Studies and you don't even have a degree, ultimately if that person sees on the table in your portfolio what they Need. desire right. for their own work, uh, they're going to choose the person who shows every sign of being able to do what they hope for. So talent and will, so, so will, talent and, will win out a lot of times. Yes, and of course uh, in science illustration, I mean, when you're in art, when you're making an art object, you are largely calling on your creativity to make an impression that you hope others will want to share to have your artwork. In the science illustration world, um, it's completely erroneous to think that you're not going to uh, be creative, because you will, but on the other hand, you're not exactly making your impression of what this clam looks like. You're really making a rendering of this thing, mm -hmm. and it, it needs to have some object. So you're combining an objective science standard with your abilities in the creative world as well. Mm. 